On today's Women Leaders Podcast, we're going to give you a behind the scenes look at what one of our keynotes during our Women Leadership Summit looked like. With today's special keynote from Kendall Berg, Director of IT Planning and Execution, Satera Financial Group, as she shares what it really looks like to drive success. So when you think of success and what is driving it forward, it's not always the people that we think deserve it the most, right? All of us have our own unique perspectives of who around us is doing the most work, who's leaning in the most, the value that we ourselves bring to an organization. But what drives success forward ultimately is the impact of the work that's done by the individuals, the relationships that those individuals have with the people responsible for deciding who progresses in their career, and then ultimately how that work is showcased and shared across the organization. There are so many times in probably all of our experience where we've seen individuals who do great, great work. They do great things, but it never quite gets the attention that it deserves. And there's a little bit of strategy involved in how you position yourself well to drive forward your own success. So I've heard this phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I've also heard the squeaky wheel gets the cheese. I'm not entirely sure (laughs) which one is correct, but ultimately what it comes down to is that communication is key right? If you are not communicating the value that you bring to an organization, then ultimately, no matter how hard you work, no matter how many hours you put in, your success will be stifled by that limitation. And so I'm a rather tactical person. I like to think about the individual action items that you can take that will ultimately drive your success forward. So as we talk about building your brand, as we talk about self-advocating, we will specifically talk about how you do that starting this afternoon when you go back to work or starting tomorrow when you log on, what are some of those actions you take? And these are kind of the five categories that we'll talk through in our time today. So the first is networking and building your influencer list. So we would all like to believe that our careers are a meritocracy, that if you do good work, you are rewarded for that work in kind. But the reality is that the decision of who gets promoted ultimately comes down to a few key individuals generally, in most working experiences. And while that may not necessarily be the way we all want it to work, coming to terms with how you can best build relationships with those influential people and understand what they're looking for so that you can effectively meet their their expectations is key. Mm-hmm. And so how do you network? How do you build your influencer list? This is something that we'll kind of talk through as we go through this today. Second thing is building your brand, which is defining who you are and who you want to be. And then how do you take that brand and perpetuate it through the organization, right? Nike is a great example of this. If I say Nike, you probably think either Air Jordans or just do it. But that didn't happen on accident. It's not like Nike in a back room said, oh, we're going to be the just do it company, but we won't tell anybody and we'll see if they think the same thing. They put it on everything. It's on the letterhead. It's on the brand. It's on the marketing. You see it a million times and you begin to associate that with that brand. And the same is true of yourself and how you show up to work and how you progress your own career and how you take that ownership. The third thing that we'll talk about is trading non-promotable tasks for big impact projects. And there's some nuance to this. Um, Non-promotable tasks is one of my favorite things to talk about with my team There will always be non-promotable work that you do, but it should not be all of the work that you do. And how do you differentiate between the two and use that to help yourself? And then skill building and diversification, continuing to learn. Um, I think uh, Juan talked about it in the first section. um, And I also work with a doctoral student who's studying this right now, that the more senior you get in your career, the higher you get closer to that executive level, the less you think you have to learn. And the reality is. The opposite is true. We are all getting dumber. We are all getting further away from the time where we studied these things, where we were open learners, where we were receptive to different ways to tackling problems and finding solutions. And so to her point, staying humble and leaning in and continuing to build your skills really is what's going to help you get to the level that you want to. And then the last piece is all about asking the right questions, speaking up and being involved. 
So we'll kind of go through each of these five things today, and then I will give homework because I'm that type of person um, and happy to answer any questions at the end. So the first thing that we're going to tackle is who has power over your career? And something that I often share with people is that you have a responsibility to your career. You have a responsibility to your own success. You have to take that action and that ownership, but you do not have exclusive power over what happens in your career. Oftentimes we are at the whims of a bad leader, as we've already discussed today, or we're at the whims of a company structure or company culture that has limitations on career progression. So what's really key is to understand not only what responsibility you have to continue to progress yourself, but also who else is in the game that we need to be paying attention to. So one way to do this is to create an influencer list. So we're going to talk through uh, one of my favorite ways to do this. And this is from a book called Stealing the Corner Office. And uh, the preface that I will say about this book, if you go read it, is he is very clearly trying to pick a fight with somebody. I don't know who the reader, somebody he worked with once. So his language is very, uh, he is picking a fight. So take that worth a grain of salt, but he does go through this exercise. And I think that it's a really key one. And it's something that I've always done subconsciously, but now very much focus with myself and my teams to continue doing. So the first is to list out the people that you're interacting with most often, or the people, you know, have power in your career, right? So for example, you could have somebody two levels higher than you that you very rarely interact with, but they may hold a lot of power. You're going to list out these individuals, their titles, their relationship to you. And then the remaining of these are going to be scores one through five. So if they are more senior than you, they get a five. Less senior than you, they get a one. Same level, they get a three. Risk. Do they pose a risk to your career? Are they very negatively outspoken? Do they have the power to fire you? That could get them a high risk factor. Do they have direct power over you? So your manager and your skip manager will almost always score highest in this category. Do they have responsibility for your exposure? If you work with a partner group and there's someone on that team who could keep you from getting the exposure you need or advocate for you to get exposure you're not getting, high score in this category. Do they instill fear across the organization? We've all worked with somebody like that, right? That just the idea you're going to be on a project with them, a little bit of heart palpitations. Do they provide validation for your work, for your career, your progression? And how much power do you think they'll hold in the future? I've worked with individuals in the past who I'm like, wow, they are so unbelievably capable. They're thought of so well across the organization. They're probably going to move up really high in the future. That would give them a high future score. Then you total all of those up and you stack rank them highest to lowest. Now, this does seem like a very mathematical way to approach this. And I'm a math major, economics major. I live in the numbers. And so this can feel a little bit dehumanizing and a little bit inauthentic, but it's not intended to be. It's really an exercise for you to understand who out there is going to have power over whether or not you're progressing in the way that you want to be. Then you're going to reach out to at least your top five and build relationships with them. So odds are some of these people you'll already have relationships with. They'll be your manager. They'll be your skip leader. They'll be an executive in your space. But somebody may show up who's a peer of yours who you don't spend very much time with. But when you go through this exercise, you realize like, oh, wow, they really they really do hold a lot of sway. Build those initial relationships, get to know them. And this is an evaluation of how much of a relationship with these individuals you want to have. This is not a sleazy car salesman tactic of I'm going to pick the number one and become their best friend. <laughs> But it is important for each of us to understand who around us is going to have power over that career progression and that development. And then as you meet with them, you're going to determine how often and when to cultivate that relationship, right? So if that's somebody in your org who you seem to get along with well, they have a lot of power. Maybe you're meeting with them on a quarterly basis just to stay in sync. Maybe you want to learn more about them and their division, how they progressed. It's very important to focus on how you want to cultivate these relationships. So it's not just a meet, it's not just a list, but it's an ongoing relationship. And I apologize. It is thundering and hailing here. So if it gets bad, let me know. And I, I will put on headphones. Um, and then the second piece becomes, who are you? So you've identified the people who have control over your career. They have influence over how you progress. The second piece you have exclusive ownership of, which is who are you? 
And I often say that your brand should walk into a room before you do and leave long after you leave, right? So your brand, how you are represented across your organization and to the people that you work with, that precedes you, right? It's it's the same as the rumor mill, right? We've all heard at least one work rumor that spread like wildfire, whether it was true or not true. And the same is true of this brand that you build for yourself and that you cultivate for yourself. So as you continue to progress, you need to outline who you want to be. You need to outline what you want your brand to say about you. Branding does not happen on accident. All right. I wish it did make all of our lives easier, but it doesn't. Your brand should align with the strengths that you have that differentiate you from your competition. I think Juan touched on that earlier. To progress your career, you got to be a little bit competitive. All right. What differentiates you? What makes you strong? And then you need to sell that about yourself, sell that ability and that capability to your leaders, to your teams, to your project groups. And then the third thing is you need to identify projects that will set you up for success to either reinforce that brand build that brand or highlight why that brand is a good fit for the company. And I'll give you a perfect example. So I work for a CTO. I run planning and execution, which basically means whatever that they need. And my brand is that I am organized and high, highly results driven, right? And that brand did not come about on accident. If you ask me what I do for the company, I help organize a lot of the chaos and I make sure that we achieve our results and our goals. That's how I talk about myself. And every project that I'm brought into is a direct result of somebody going, wow, this project's kind of unorganized. We should bring in Kendall. Because that is the reputation and the brand that I built for myself that I cultivated very intentionally. And that brand should be kind of a combination of your image, your mission. What do you bring? Part of my mission is that I'm incredibly passionate about mentorship and coaching. I've mentored hundreds of individuals. I've coached even more. I've led multiple people to two and three time promotions in very short time spans. That's part of my mission is to grow the next generation of leaders. It's part of why I'm here today, but your mission becomes part of your brand. Then your values become part of your brand. What is important to you? What value do you bring to the organization? But what value do you expect from the organization? And then what is your vision for yourself and your own growth? Right? Do you want to be CEO one day? Have a plan. Know where you're headed. And use that to create your brand and then use that language to talk about yourself as well as to highlight the skills that you already bring to the table. The next piece is driving impact across your organization. And we're going to talk about what a non-promotable task is and how it hurts you. So I think there's a common misconception that all of your work is business critical. And for some people it is, if you work in audit risk, pretty mission critical, right? But if I hire somebody to run a report every week and they do it, comes out perfectly on time, comes out perfectly correct every week on the same day, and they don't do anything else, should I promote them? The general answer is no. They are doing their task very well. They deserve to be compensated fairly for it. But doing that task well does not open them up to the next level of seniority. It does not progress their career in the direction that they want to go. And so it's important to be able to identify and seize large scale, large impact projects across your organization. Right? What are the things that are going to change the way that your company operates? And using the same example of the person who ran the report, what if they ran that report every week, but then they automated it? And when they automated it, they communicated it to all of the business partner groups that consumed that report so that it was on demand and in real time. And then they scaled that report to hit more business units. Suddenly, this is a very promotable work. It's about seizing that opportunity to create and drive impact. So that's going to be partially understanding your own strengths, right? If you do not understand automation, reporting structure, and data, that would be a bad job for you to take. (laughs) It's not going to help you get where you want to get. 
But if you do love data and you have experience with tools like Power BI or Tableau and you want to lean into that, that could be a great opportunity for you to apply your strengths in an existing area. And then you look for those opportunities to drive that value across your organization, like automation, like real-time data. And then you're going to work for opportunities to collaborate across multiple groups. The more parts of your business that you touch, the more people who know your brand, who support your reputation, and who can help you progress your career. It also grows your influencer list. So now we've come full circle. So as you build your brand, as you start applying it on high impact projects, as you're building relationships with your influencer, how do you not go stale? How do you not become irrelevant? My favorite example of this is uh, print marketing, right? So if in the 80s, you were a print marketing specialist, you were in incredibly high demand, incredibly high demand, newspapers, magazines, even television written content, such high demand. But if you did not pivot between 1980 and now to digital marketing, you are much less competitive in your field. And so the saying is, if you're not learning, you're failing slowly and maybe not noticeably, but you're definitely slowing down your own trajectory and your own growth. So if you look at the 2023 most in-demand skills list, according to LinkedIn, you will probably not be surprised to see that the top four to five are all soft skills. Management, communication, customer service, leadership, even sales to an extent. Those are not hard skills that are learned and studied. Those are soft skills. But that doesn't mean you can't be improving your skill in this space. It doesn't mean you can't be attending trainings like this or calling into monthly meetings or reading books on self-development. That's the way you build those skills. And they are more in demand than technical skills, especially the higher you get in your career. In addition to that, being able to project manage, research, and analyze data increasingly important. And that's for all roles, not just tech specific or data specific. Where I see people struggle with skill building, diversification, leadership, management is going to touch on the same thing that Juan touched on earlier, which is imposter syndrome. So if you look at the Webster dictionary definition, it says the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own effort or skills. Right. This goes back to what she said. The best and brightest above uh, of us think that we either don't deserve where we are, we can't do what we're supposed to be doing. Now, the way that I reframe this when I'm working with clients I'm coaching or when I'm working with people who work for me is it is not about a lack of confidence. It is about a lack of trust in yourself. Do you trust yourself to improve your leadership skills? Do you trust yourself? to communicate effectively? Do you trust yourself to learn things you've never had to do before? If you can trust your own ability to learn new things, you will overcome your imposter syndrome. But it requires not only that faith in self, but that faith in your learning ability. And the best way to maintain that trust, that faith is to do it often. If you are always learning, suddenly there's a lot less risk of imposter syndrome because you're doing it all the time. The next bit is to ask the right questions. And this really comes down to understanding what executives and what leaders care about. For you to build your brand, your reputation, for you to get high impact projects, you need to be speaking up on calls and asking the right questions. And there's a lot of ways to ask questions that doesn't derail a meeting, right? Hey, I really appreciate where we're going with this. I was curious, as I think about this one subset of the business, have we thought about how it would apply to them? Because I know there's a lot of nuance in that space. Ask those questions, push for those truths, but make sure that you're doing it in a way which is ultimately going to deliver on what executives care about. It's not just about what you need to know. It's about what leadership needs to know and how you can facilitate that information. So this is a very high level example, but finance as the executive, they're, they care about Costs and savings, technology, they care about client experience. At least we hope so. Marketing and sales, they care about revenue, right? Generally, these are the things you care about. So as you interact with these leaders, making sure that the information you're offering up freely is going to address their value statements 
and or that the questions you're asking are going to give them more information about their value statements, sets you up for success as you interact with those higher levels of seniority. So it's a lot of information as you start to build your brand and advocate for yourself. You have to be intentional, right? And this is where it gets a little bit messy because I think a lot of people confuse intentionality with inauthenticity. You don't want to become a fake version of yourself that only cares about what other people need and what other people think. But you can take responsibility for your career and ensure that the things you're doing align with how you want to think of yourself, how you want other people to think of you, to build those strong relationships that are going to help you progress in a way that allows you to stay authentic to who you are, right? Your brand should not be the antithesis of how you show up to work. It would be very hard to maintain. But then you need to advocate for yourself. You need to lean in and communicate this to people in order to continue to grow. So the next question is, where do you go from here, right? You're responsible for your own success and growth. This conversation has really jazzed you up. You're ready to lean in. You're ready to start building your brand, advocating for yourself, sharing this across your organization. How do you do that? So the first thing is that you are going to build out your influencer list and you're going to set meetings with your top five in the next month. Don't wait. Most studies show that 80% of leadership trainings like this are actually ineffectual because people don't know what to do after. So they go back to their jobs. They keep doing what they've always been doing. They think that was really nice to learn all that. You have homework. Do your homework. The second thing is going to be to build your 11 list. So I built an 11 list eight years ago. It is still in my drawer. I still look at it every quarter. And what it is, is it is five statements of who you want to be at work, how you want to show up, how do you want to be known, what is your brand, and five statements of who you don't want to be. I don't want to be a micromanager. I don't want to be seen as somebody who doesn't follow through on their deliverables. And then you're going to combine those 10 things to create one branded mission statement. I want to bring value to my organization by being organized and results-oriented while building the next generation of leaders to support my organization. There's your mission statement. And you should look back at this 11 list every quarter and say, am I doing that? Am I showing up as my best self? And then the third thing is identify one project that you could propose that would be high impact. Maybe it's for your team, maybe it's for another team. And or one project you could get involved in that's pre-existing that would allow you to demonstrate your new brand and your strengths in a way that helps you progress in order to get to your goals. And then the last thing is pick two skills that you want or need to learn this year. I want to lean in more on my leadership skills. I want to lean in more on analytics and data. I want to understand what tools are coming through that are most popular for my division. Where do you want to lean in so that you can add value to your organization and your team? Wow, what incredible insight on how to drive success. We hope you enjoyed this presentation of what it looks like behind the scenes of being a part of the Women Leaders Association. To learn more, visit womenleaderspodcast.com to find a chapter near you and learn how you too can become a member of the Women Leaders Association and have incredible conversations just like this one. We'll see you next time.